In this video, we're going to look at the mechanism of action of oxytocin. And specifically, we're going to be investigating oxytocin use in the third stage of labor. So this is specifically oxytocin that's being delivered in order to reduce the risk of postpartum hemorrhage and to reduce the need for additional uterotonics during that third stage of labor. So oxytocin uh, during this time, it suggested that it is an IM dose of 10 units. So we'd be looking at an IM dose of 10 units of oxytocin. And again, review of uh, this administration suggests that this dose in the third stage of labor will reduce the risk of postpartum hemorrhage. So again, low to moderate evidence to suggest that prophylactic use of oxytocin will reduce uh, patient risk of postpartum hemorrhage compared to placebo or other uterine tonics. And additionally, fairly significant evidence to suggest that oxytocin use in the third stage of labor will reduce the need for additional uterine tonic during this stage of labor. So this evidence is enough to suggest that oxytocin should be administered prophylactically for patients who are in in the third stage of labor as a result of the potential to reduce the risk for postpartum hemorrhage and to reduce the risk for additional uterotonics. When we're looking at creation and release of oxytocin, we're looking at two areas of the brain. First, oxytocin will be created in the hypothalamus. So the hypothalamus is responsible for the production of oxytocin. And then the oxytocin that is created in the hypothalamus will travel via the blood supply down to the posterior pituitary gland. And this is where we see release of oxytocin from. So oxytocin is released by the posterior pituitary gland. Now what's interesting about oxytocin is that it functions under a positive feedback loop. Most hormones use a negative feedback loop, so what that means is as the blood concentration of that hormone goes up, you actually start to see reduced stimulation of the place that's going to release that hormone, that's negative feedback. Now oxytocin actually works under a positive feedback loop, so what that means is as we increase the amount of oxytocin in the blood supply, that's actually going to trigger increased production and release of oxytocin from the brain. So the more oxytocin we have in our body, the more oxytocin is going to be released by the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. So now we can take a look at what this actually means for labor. So as we begin the birthing process and the fetus is engaging with the cervix, that pressure is noted by the nerves around the cervix and that signal is sent to the brain. And this is how we will start seeing the increase in oxytocin being released into the blood supply as a result of labor. So pressure from the fetus pushing down on the cervix will lead to stimulation of the nerve fibers around the cervix, which will then lead to that nerve sending a signal up to the pituitary gland and the hypothalamus, and we're going to re release oxytocin from the posterior pituitary. Now what we know already is that as we release oxytocin, that will stimulate a positive feedback loop, which will lead to the further release of more oxytocin. What is interesting about this process is that as the fetus engages more and more into the pelvis, we're going to see more stimulation of those nerve fibers, which will again lead to further stimulation of the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland to release oxytocin. The other thing that's going to happen is as we have uterine contraction, we're also going to stimulate those nerve fibers to further release oxytocin from the posterior pituitary gland. So the fetus making its way into the birth canal and causing stretch of those receptors is going to lead to the release of oxytocin from the pituitary gland. That's going to lead to increased uterine contraction, and that uterine contraction is also going to stimulate those nerve fibers, which will then also lead to more oxytocin being released. So again, this is part of that positive feedback loop is the more we have being released, the stronger contractions are. The stronger contractions are, the more these nerves are being stimulated, and the more those nerves are being stimulated, the more oxytocin that's being released into the blood supply. So now this explains the release of oxytocin and how oxytocin ends up having a positive feedback loop where we see more being produced and released as our blood concentrations rise. But this doesn't explain how it actually performs the function of increasing uterine contraction. And when we look at the third stage of labor, and we're looking at attempting to reduce the risk of postpartum hemorrhage, one of the things that we want to do is figure out, well, how does oxytocin actually reduce the risk of postpartum hemorrhage by increasing the strength of contraction? The way that happens is through G protein receptors. So there are G protein receptors that are located in the myofibrils of the myometrium. That's the muscle layer of the uterus. So we have G protein receptors and these G protein receptors will respond to oxytocin. So what happens is oxytocin will bind to the G protein receptor. It will go through an intracellular signaling cascade, which is going to increase the infiltration of calcium ions into the myometrium. So what we end up seeing is an increased concentration of calcium ions in the myometrium. We know that calcium is responsible for the strength of muscle contraction, and the more calcium we have, the stronger our contractions are going to be. So oxytocin binds to a G protein receptor, 
is going to cause an intracellular signaling cascade that's going to increase the concentration of calcium ions within the myometrium myofibrils and the muscle uh, filaments of the uh, myometrium. And then as that calcium concentration rises, we get stronger contraction. So again, to uh, provide what that looks like, we know that as we begin to have fetal progression, to so fetal progression, we're going to activate stretch receptors. Those stretch receptors will activate nerves that will signal the posterior pituitary to release oxytocin. Oxytocin will bind to G protein receptors, which will lead to an influx of calcium and increase the concentration of calcium in the myometrium myofibrils. And this will increase uterine contraction. Where the positive feedback loop comes in is we know that as we increase uterine contraction, we're then going to activate these receptors again, which recognize that there's pressure on the areas of the pelvis that are involved in childbirth, which will then lead to more nerve signaling to the posterior pituitary, more release of oxytocin, more activation of G protein receptors, increased concentration of calcium and myofibrils, and further increase in uterine contraction. Now that we've talked about the mechanism of action of oxytocin, we can take a look at why administration of an exogenous bolus of oxytocin during the third stage of labor may be effective to prevent postpartum hemorrhage and the need for additional uterotonics. In order to understand why a bolus dose of oxytocin would be beneficial, we have to understand two things. One is that oxytocin will reach a peak onset within three to five minutes. This means when oxytocin is released from the posterior pituitary, or when we've given an IM dose exogenously, that within three to five minutes, we'll start to see contraction of the uterus and strong contraction of the uterus. It is this contraction which is going to lead to the positive feedback or subsequent release of oxytocin and we're going to start this feedback loop all over again. The other thing to be mindful of is that we have a duration of action of approximately two to three hours. This means that the function of oxytocin is not going to be indefinite. Around the two to three hour mark, we st start to see a reduction in the function of the oxytocin. It starts to be metabolized by the liver and the kidneys. As a result, we start seeing weaker uterine contraction, which means that we're not going to release as much oxytocin from the pituitary gland, and this feedback cycle will start to diminish. So we think about this from the perspective of labor. As the fetal head engages into the pelvis and creates stretch in the cervix and causes activation of stretch receptors that are going to send a signal to the hypothalamus to release oxytocin from the pituitary gland, that is the onset of labor. So that engagement of the fetal head, the activation of those nerve fibers, and the release of that oxytocin starts this two to three hour timer for that oxytocin. And we will continue to see this positive feedback loop occurring as the fetus progresses through the birth canal and is activating those stretch receptors until the fetus is born. Now, once the fetus is born, the body's relying on the contraction of the uterus to stimulate these receptors and then release more oxytocin. And we know what can happen is the uterus can become fatigued or there can be pathology that may prevent the uterus from contracting fully. And as a result, as the fetus or after the fetus is born, we can see a decreased strength and contraction and we know that that will actually lead to decreased nerve activation and decreased oxytocin release. So the provision of oxytocin is going to be a benefit because we know that we're only going to get about two to three hours of use out of the oxytocin that's being released endogenously or through the body. So when we get to that third stage of labor, in order to prevent the decrease in oxytocin levels or the decrease in contractility that may occur in the third stage of labor following delivery of the fetus, a bolus dose or an IM dose of 10 units of exogenous oxytocin by a healthcare professional can lead to increase in uterine contraction. So that big bolus will lead to strong uterine contraction, which will start this cycle over again because nerves will be stimulated, which will lead to stimulation of the hypothalamus and the posterior pituitary, and we'll start this strong positive feedback loop over again. And the research tells us that that IM dose of 10 units of oxytocin prophylactically does support an increase in uterine contraction, does support prolonged uterine contraction during the third stage of labor, promotes delivery of the placenta, and decreases the chances of postpartum hemorrhage. If that's the case, this patient also becomes at less risk of needing additional uterotonics or stronger uterotonics to stimulate that uterine contraction because we've maintained that positive feedback loop during the third stage of labor in order to deliver that placenta. Now, there are a few things to be mindful of in terms of risk. The primary risk is that oxytocin has been shown to increase vasoconstriction, which would increase blood pressure. As a result, there are a few things that practitioners should be mindful of. One is that the patient should have a blood pressure of less than 160 systolic in order to receive 
receive oxytocin. This will prevent a hypertensive crisis in the patient who is receiving oxytocin, especially because once the feedback loop st starts, it's very challenging to stop that feedback loop. So because that feedback loop can lead to vasoconstriction, oxytocin could be dangerous in patients who have a blood pressure of over 160 because it could lead to a fairly dramatic spike in their blood pressure. So because of this risk of increased blood pressure, it should be contraindicated in patients who have eclampsia, or preeclampsia. Finally, something else to be mindful of is that oxytocin tends to lose its effectiveness. We're looking at patients who are greater than four hours post placental delivery. In those patients, uh, typically what we're seeing is clotting issues or that fourth factor, that thrombin factor could be an issue for these patients and they may require alternative treatment for their postpartum hemorrhage.